Good evening. Hi, and welcome. My name is Valerie Paley, and I am the Sue Ann Weinberg Director of the Patricia D. Klingenstein Library at the New York Historical Society. I'm thrilled to welcome you to Primary Source, a new series of free and public programs exploring how the Patricia D. Klingenstein Library at New York Historical supports new research and historical inquiry. For over 200 years, the library has documented our shared history through manuscripts, books, maps, newspapers, photographs, architectural drawings, prints, and more. These primary sources are available to researchers, students, and all those curious about our past and present. Before we, we begin tonight's program, I'd like to thank the New York Historical Society's president, Louise Mirror, our board chair, Agnes Su Tang, the uh, board of trustees, our library committee, and its chair, Sid Lapidus, our Chairman's Council members, and the Leon Levy Foundation for their generous ongoing support of the library here. It is their support that makes exciting new programs, such as this one, possible, and allow us to continue to grow our programming. So for those of you who were present at our first program with John Wood Sweet speaking about his prize-winning book, The Sewing Girl's Tale, welcome back. We're thrilled that you have such an interest in the library's vast collections and the extraordinary scholarship that comes out of it. But tonight, I am joined by Sarah Cedar Miller to discuss her new book, Before Central Park, colossally uh, well-researched and uh, colossally important and colossally out of print. Already we're in our second printing, so unfortunately we don't have any books uh, for a signing, but please do. Uh, come back to our bookstore or look for it online, I guess. Um, his Sarah has been the historian emerita of the Central Park Conservancy since 2017. She was previously the Conservancy photographer from 1994 and its historian from 1989 until 2017. Her knowledge of Central Park's history is expansive. And that's, uh, that's an understatement, really. And uh, she has written several books on the subject, such as Strawberry Fields, Central Park's Memorial to John Lennon, Seeing Central Park, the official guidebook, and Central Park, an American masterpiece. In 2020, Sarah was named a preservation hero by the Library of American Landscape History. So our program will last around 45 minutes with time for Q&A. And before we, we begin, I ask you to silence your cell phones or anything that makes noise so as not to be disruptive. And please do think about your questions as we're um, going through the slides and, um, and be ready with them uh, at around minute 45. <laughs> we're thrilled to have Sarah here with us today to discuss the library's collections that she used in her research. Welcome. So before Central Park, uh, this book, uh, is gathering enormous interest. As I said, it's in its second printing already. Uh, the uh, narrative spans from 1625 to 1863 and beyond. And if you haven't seen it or read it or looked at it, it is divided into three parts, topography, real estate, and the idea of a park, which sounds a little bit abstract, but in, uh, it is a rich intersection of place, people, and thing and events and uh, history. And uh, it has been many years in, in the making. Uh, I've been researching this since 1990 or so. And, uh, and it shows. But I think there, there are many ways we could look at this book. But I think today, we feel the best way to go is sort of episodically. Uh, and Sarah has picked out some images that she's used in her archival research. And we'll just speak to the images and the history behind them. So welcome, Sarah. Well, thank you so much for having me. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, everybody loves Central Park. And its history is you know, just, I think I scratched the surface. It's hopefully ongoing, and hopefully many of you will be in, interested enough to do your own research. We can always use more. Um, it was a thrill to do this, and it is particularly a thrill, a real thrill for me to be here in this room, because this was my home away from home. There was, other than the city's records, no other place had the records so helpful to me whether it was photographs, paintings, archives, maps, everything. It, it was so informative. I, I, 
the most happiest moments were in this room. I can't tell you. I, I, That's I really mean, nice happy. to hear. <laughs> I, the discovery, you know, it's being a detective. Being a historian is being a detective. And I did my detective work here. And so, um, and the, the um, victims are all over the place in this building. And um, they tell such stories. And you know what was saved are all the things you would never think to save, like a little stock certificate or a clipping from a newspaper that opened worlds to me. And, and this place has it. It's not just the big important documents, but the smallest little things that each one of them tells stories. So tonight, we're just going to show you a few things. I, I hope you will read the book. I'm sure the library has one copy, so um, I'm happy to donate a second copy. Oh, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we can start. Um, my job is to do the slides. And if I start coughing, I apologize. I'm not sick, um, but I have a cough, and I may have to stop. So this. The, one of the thrills, I have you know, worked for the Central Park Conservancy and worked for the park since 1984, and almost immediately I heard about uh, the McGowan's Tavern that doesn't exist anymore, but is on the composting area of the park, which if you don't know it, it's up along the East Drive at about 105th Street. And it's the sort of only not very pretty part of Central Park, but important because it's where we make our compost that keeps the park green and beautiful. However, it was the site, um, starting in 1756, of a tavern because the Kingsbridge Road, which I'll also talk about, um, came right by it, is part of the East Drive. And uh, throughout, the, the, it was... Um, halfway between one end of Manhattan and the other. And remember, Manhattan is an island, of course. And in order to get off or onto Manhattan Island, you needed a road and bridge. And the bridge was called King's Bridge. So eventually, the road, when it was under English possession, was called the King's Bridge Road. And if you know your Bronx, part of the Bronx, King's Bridge is the first neighborhood from Manhattan to, and so the King's Bridge was this low-lying bridge um, that, you know, before the one that's on 225th Street today that cars and people go over. But um, there were taverns because you needed to refresh your horse, and around this road in what became Central Park was Mrs. McGowan's Tavern. And this is Margaret McGowan. Um, originally, she was a Benson. The Dutch loved to marry their cousins. Everybody um, was interrelated in one way or another. And Margaret um, Benson married uh, Andrew McGowan, who was also a Benson. His mother was a Benson. And so they were related. But OK, no one seems to have had a problem with that. It was very culturally determined. And people wanted to keep the money and the property in the same family. And so I had never ever dreamed I would see a portrait of, of any McGowan. And there are seven in this collection, and um, all given by um, descendants of the McGowan family. And I, I cried, literally. When I saw this, at first, I started to cry. Because, you know, just to hear about um, people and see their face, what strikes me about this is about Margaret and her mother's portrait as well, is that they look quite elderly, but look, they have brown hair. And that probably places them in their 40s about, at best, and they look so much older than that, than we would today. It just shows that life was very different, even physiognomically, and um, she's holding her Bible, her mother's holding her Bible. There's a touch of red in the seat, and uh, which shows that they were not very flashy people. But their tavern was um, important. And uh, one of the things that I discovered about the tavern was that there was a major turning point in the Revolutionary War um, with George Washington and all of his generals that took place in McGowan's Tavern, now in Central Park. And I was almost shocked. I was shocked to learn this. So how did I learn this? Well, it turns out that um, this wonderful library has the uh, 
our, um, papers of Alexander McDougall. And Alexander McDougall was a general in, in the war. And um, he, so let's, let me go back to set the scene. So in September of 1776, the British are surrounding Manhattan Island with ships and Hessian soldiers, and they know they're going to attack. Washington wants to stay and defend the city. He doesn't want to leave. Uh, General Green, uh, Nathaniel Green, he wants to burn down the city. He's like, why should we let the British have it? We're going to lose. Let's burn it down. But the people in the Constitutional Convention, I mean, not Con Continental Congress, in Philadelphia, they say, um, you can't burn down the city. So, okay, we're going to stay and fight. And then the ships keep coming. They have a peace conference, a, a few things happen, and five days later, the generals say, even though it's against military protocol, we really, really need to um, have another Council of War meeting. But where was it? Well, I'm not one of those nerdy people who always want to know where everything took place. And um, long story short, I'm reading the papers of George Washington on September 12th, and sure enough, the footnote by the editor of the George Washington paper says, it's in Mrs. McGowan's tavern. I learned this 25 or 30 years ago. And I, like, how am I going to find, why did they know this? I don't know this. Nobody in Central Park knows this. How can we find out? And so, um, long st I read the only biography of Alexander McDougall, but I'm not like Robert Caro. I don't turn every page. <laughs> And so I read the chapter before it. I read the chapter of 17 September. I maybe I go to uh, October or November. Nothing. I close the book 25 years later. I'm writing this book now. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to have to read the whole book. I like know about Robert Caro at this point. I love him. And um, he is my so true we. hero. He is my hero. And so I read, and six years later, McDougal and General Heath are at West Point. They hate each other. Heath is McDougal's um, superior officer. And one night at what McDougal calls a social hour, this is all in his manuscripts, um, he tells junior officers that um, nine generals voted for evacuating at this secret meeting, and three were against it, and General Heath was one of the three who was a knave, and um, he lets this happen, and then Heath court-martials uh, McDougal, and there's a big court-martial case all in the documents here, and um, he is found guilty of the seven charges. He's found guilty of one tell telling military secrets of a secret meeting in um, Mrs. McGowan's tavern. He says it. That's why it's in the papers. But it took me 30 years to finally read the book. And I learned my lesson, turn every page. <laughs> so um, that is Mrs. McGowan and her tavern. Um, there's lots you could say, but we don't have time for that. <laughs> okay. That's ch uh, in, a, in my book. Okay. Um, oh, I have to turn the chair. Right. Yes. Um, okay. That's a good idea. Give me less to do. All right. Um, so this is a piece of paper about so big in, in um, the uh, papers here in the uh, archives. And it is uh, Mrs. McGowan's and Andrew McGowan's enslaved person their Jane. So this is a birth certificate for Jane's child, Eliza. She also has a, a child, Betty, born in, um, this is 1810. Betty is born in eight, uh, 1805. And um, Jane, this is the piece of paper, the only paper I could find that we know that an actual enslaved person um, lived and worked in what is now Central Park. So it's quite um, important. In what, in what collection was this? It's in um, the, uh, oh, you're asking me a hard question. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no, um, I, I, it has something to do with 
Harlem, I think. Oh, how in the Harlem. Uh, Harlem so you Harlem. really have turned every page. You've oh, I've at turned so every... many different collections. Now, oh, you yeah. would think that she would be looking only at stuff pertaining to Central Park, well, per se, but no, it goes in many different directions. It's because your staff is so wonderful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's all true. I mean, I didn't know. I mean, it was Ted O'Reilly who, I'm asking him this question about something that will come up next. Oh, well, let's do next. Oh, okay. And, um, yes. So, here's another story. Uh, I chose this based on stories. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> um, there's no rhyme or reason, except some have better stories than others. So, um, I am in Bosco Bell, upstate, which is a, a Dykeman, state's Dykeman, and I'm looking for, because Jacob Dykeman was the first owner of Mrs. McGowan's Tavern. And I'm doing research on the Dykeman family. He married a Benson, Catalina Benson Dykeman. And I'm doing research, and I'm not finding anything interesting. And I see this rusty paper clip. And I don't know why, but That's something made me. That's not archivally correct. Uh-oh. <laughs> right, like rusty paper clip, no. not opened in years. <laughs> and I take it out, and it's two, um, you could say Xerox, because that's what they were, uh, Xerox copies, of a will of Adolph Benson and the will of Tanika Benson. And I read them, and sure enough, I see that they have enslaved, and they are um, a, a woman named Len in one one and uh, Lane, she's called Len in one and Lane in another, and um, they are giving their um, family member, Adolf is giving his, his sister-in-law um, Lane, and then Lane has a will, and she's giving it to uh, these other people. And so I had been researching um, a piece of property uh, owned by a woman named Lenore Benson. And Lenore, very unusual name because, uh, but you know, I didn't really understand. She owns a tiny little piece of property, four acres. That's basically the last northeast corner of Central Park, all of what is now Duke Ellington Circle, and all the way up to 113th Street. It's like a little triangle. And, and her name is Lenore Benson. And James Riker, who writes the revised history of Harlem, another footnote, I love the little footnotes because that's where all the action is, and it says, Lenore Benson, a colored woman. I'm like, okay, what's that about? There are no black Bensons. There are only black enslaved people Bensons who have, you know, the family, it's, they consider it their property, they give it their last name. And so... Long story short, I do this research, and sure enough, Lenore Benson is um, enslaved by someone named David Waldron. But she gets her freedom, well, she gets, makes a deal with her um, enslaver to um, buy property for 18 pounds in 1793. And then, long story short, in 1799, she sells her property for 221 pounds, four acres in the middle of nowhere, and uh, marshy and swampy. I'm like, go Lenore, you know, you buy it in, in 1793 for um, 18 pounds, and six years later you sell it for 221 pounds. What's that all about? So I know I don't understand. And I'm like, not, I'm not understanding. Then I read, for some reason, I am reading the wonderful book on slavery of the exhibit from this building. Slavery in New York. This, or, this wonderful book. And I'm reading Jill Lepore's essay. And it says, yes, in, in 1712, there was a slave rebellion. And everyone was punished. And you couldn't be manumitted unless you paid 200 pounds to the government and 20 more in order to um, keep yourself an annuity so that you weren't a burden on the government. Like, and there it was. So I then um, understood 
that Lenore got her freedom. And what she did was sell John Rankin, a Scottish grocer who didn't live anywhere near there, um, three quarters of her property and one quarter of it she kept for herself. That was put, she moved the house from near what would have been in Central Park all the way up to what is now 113th Street. And she had her annuity, she had the 200 pounds, she bought her freedom. And so uh, there's much more to the story, but essentially the gist of it is that um, she was able to buy her property, uh, to free herself by a real estate deal that has a small piece of Central Park, possibly only the perimeter from 109th to 110th Street. But at that, you know, when um, 1899, uh, Frederick, not Frederick Douglass Circle, Duke Ellington Circle, but the, that, that corner got chopped up into a traffic circle, but she owned Central Park and she owned what's amazing, because I think she came from Africa, is that she owned the land that the African Center across the street from the park is also. That's and wonderful. so, what a wonderful um, coincidence. It, you know, I mean, it, it, I tell it much better. <laughs> in fact, it, this might only be the second time in public I'm actually telling the story, but it, it's very complicated, but it's that will up there. Adolf Benson wrote a will because he must have thought he was dying when he was like 45 years old. He lived another 40 years. And that is the only copy. And it's in the Harlem collection. And it's only because of Ted O'Reilly that uh, our, our former manuscript curator who showed me the Harlem collection that I found so much information that was kind of loose ends and missing pieces. Yeah, and this document is from 1754, there. so, yeah. yeah. yeah he, so he died in like 1802. That's interesting. Here, I'm gonna move on, yep. okay? So, um, British, the British were in um, Central Park for seven years, and uh, they, we know from Olmsted, and when they were building the park, that there were 16 huts for the Hessian soldiers. It was called a Hessian camp. Uh, and this is a painting that is owned by the Historical Society, and um, it is approximation of, from archaeologists of what one would have looked like in Inwood, but we can assume that the one in, um, it's laid out in the same rows exactly the way Olmsted found it, and he found um, below the surface of the ground these huts, hut foundations and hooks for the, um, kettles that would have boiled the water, and um, uh, also the archaeologists who worked around 1900 found red coat buttons in, in, uh, on, in the ground. So this is just an example I found of, um, you know, I'm assuming is what the camp would have looked like. That's now the Great Hill, the northern side of the Great Hill in Central Park. And so, um, and we have Olmsted, I don't have it here because it doesn't belong to the Historical Society, but we have the drawing of Olmsted or his assistants who actually drew all the huts. And so it was wonderful to see this drawing because, I mean this painting, because I could finally picture what it must have been like for these soldiers. And Philip von Kraft who wrote a diary, and it's in the library, um, he describes his life as um, a, a Hessian soldier, and so um, it, very much at McGowan's Pass, and so it brought it all to life, you know, this kind of painting. Absolutely. Next. Um, okay, so here's a, a, how can I shorten this? I don't know. <laughs> um, many years ago, I was doing an exhibit when the Dana Center at the Harlemere just had opened. Uh, a few years earlier. And I wanted to do, I did an exhibit called Northern Exposure. And I had heard that there was a cannon from the War of 1812, and it was in storage. And so I called the Parks Department historian, Jonathan Kuhn, and I said, um, you have that cannon anywhere that belongs to us? And he, he said, yeah, it's on Randall's Island. Uh, you want it? And I said, yes, please. And he said, well, do you want the mortar too? So I was like, what's a mortar? I knew nothing about military stuff. 
as you can see. So uh, he says, it's a smaller cannon. I'm like, sure. And I go out and I see these two hulky, rusty things, but I love them because they belong to us. And so we bring it back and one of my um, colleagues builds a little, uh, what would have been a stand for the cannon. It's brown and pitted and rusty, and, um, but I have my cannon. Then one day, a few years later, and it's Frederick Law Olmsted's birthday, April 26, and this is in like 1998. And for some reason, I'm leaving to go on a tour to celebrate his birthday, and I open the 1865 annual report. I don't know why, except that Fred was speaking to me. <laughs> and it says gifts, anonymous gifts, given to the park that year, and the first thing says, a cannon and a mortar from the HMS Husser, given anonymously, and an 18-pound, basically, cannonball. I am like, cannon and mortar? That's my cannon. And so, um, it, and I say, HMS Husser, what's that? And I go to, at the time, no internet, let's, you know, no, no Wikipedia, and I go to the Encyclopedia of New York, and sure enough, HMS Husser, a ship that sunk in 1780 in Hellgate, straight ahead of where that cannon is today, and um, purportedly um, sell, um, carrying a million dollars worth of gold to pay the British uh, ships. What do I do? I come here. And there is this, you have, a, a folder about this thick of all of the dives that people made in order to find the gold. And one of them in 18, well, 1856, the Worcester Diving Company brings up the cannon and mortar. Uh, and for the gold. <laughs> for the, not the gold, and a firkin of butter, which that's still fresh, they point out. And, um, so then we know that the cannon, uh, long story short, is not from the War of 1812. It's not, it is a British cannon, and my colleagues, um, who are conservators, did more research to find out that it's a carronade. It's very specific, and this little cannon, which I still call a mortar, um, may be the only instance of a, this carronade in existence. And so then we have it in storage because we're not going to put it out in the park until we, um, you know, have fixed the area around it. So we do in, 18, in uh, 2014, we're planning to do the fort landscape and we tell the conservators, you know, start conserving the cannon. Long story short, they unplug the cannon and they find a live bag, burlap bag, of gunpowder, and they have to call the New York City Police Bomb Squad, who have to come to Central Park and take away the uh, gunpowder that has been sitting in Central Park since you know 1998, and uh, unbeknownst to us. But anyway, all, all good. Nothing happened. Okay, <laughs> next slide. And so. Um, the top picture, you see the bottom house that's in, you know, painted gold in, on the bottom picture? That's McGowan's Tavern in 1814. So one of the treasures of this uh, institution are these gorgeous, and I mean gorgeous, watercolors from the War of 1814 that were done by John J. Holland. 1812, right, I call it the War of 1814 because that's when it happened in Central Park. <laughs> so, you know, frame of reference, one track mind. Uh, so, um, anyway, this is an example of one page. They're, they're huge, they're beautiful. And he didn't want to serve in the army, but he was talented, so they let him do watercolors instead. <laughs> and, um, but the top, you see, that's the gatehouse of Kingsbridge Road. And that long rampart, that long arm that's going, um, is that right? Yeah, right. Uh, in your, the archives, they have the description from a person named Daniel Burtnett, handwritten, that um, 
tells of when he was a young butcher's apprentice and built that wall with his yuck butchers. And, and it's a wonderful story. And I knew the story from reading it transcribed in a book. But when I open again those Harlem papers, and there is his handwriting verbatim of um, the whole way in which the, the guys all came here. And the butchers went to Brooklyn, but the, uh, the apprentice butch butchers came to uh, Harlem Heights and built that, built that wall. And in 2013, a tree fell down in Central Park and exposed the actual wall that the butchers built, it, the exact same spot. Remind us again where this is exactly. This is in McGowan's Pass, basically in the park, um, about 107th Street and um, 6th Avenue, you know, Malcolm X Boulevard, like right above the Harlem Mirror. And so can so we still see some we, remnants of this if we look? To, could we still see some remnants of the wall if we look? You can or? see, um, we did discover the tree brought up the King's, original Kingsbridge Road, uh, but um, I don't have a picture of it because um, I only have pictures of what the society owns. But um, it, it has tiny little stones, but then there are these big flat stones that the tree uncovered. That's the um, footing for the um, barrier gate, which is the gate in the middle of the road. Um, and you can still see where they drilled the holes. Mm -hmm. And so um, we have tours, and I'm sure our tour guides probably pointed out to you. <laughs> Wonderful. And so this, too, was um, a map. I'm, I'm just showing it because you have maps here that are so unique and only here. Um, this is a map of 1814 in Harlem Heights. Um, I won't go into it. Uh, it's too complicated, I think, for tonight. <laughs> but it, it's just I wanted at least one map just to say the maps here. I, I can't tell you how many they have and how brilliant they all are. And they all t taught me something. I mean, maps that are practically, they had to put two tables together. They're so large. Uh, and then um, maps this big. So, you know, but they gave such information. They were they're like little jewels. Uh, yeah. But I it's mean, so interesting to, to, to layer the built environment as we know it, or intermediate times but between then and now and imagine what it was like before Central Park or before anything was built on there. Right. So. And what's amazing about the maps is how much the northern end of the park is still like that. Interesting. And that's what's really great about the north end. Uh, chapter 19 of the book talks about how the north end almost didn't happen. Uh, it almost just ended at 106th Street. So very funny, actually. Next. Um, so one of the treasures here um, is James Rule Smith's um, Springs and Wells of Manhattan and the Bronx. The park has lots of springs, but there were wells and springs throughout Manhattan Island. And um, it's the reason that both the Dutch would have settled here because there was fresh water and also because um, people came in the 19th century with bottles and and. Uh, you know, to bring home what they thought was very important healing water. Uh, th there's, mil uh, you know, how many, do you know how many photographs he took? No. But, but there, there the, he did a book, well, the lost. Historical Society published, but the, this is, uh, you know, wonderful. You did an exhibit a few years ago, right? I don't remember. Uh, you I did. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> It, you know, and it looks almost exactly the same, and you see the girl is drinking from this ladle. Yeah. Well, when we were restoring this part of the park, we found the ladle in the mud, <gasps> and we have it. Oh, we still have it. Wow. And Where do you the, keep artifacts like um, that? I don't know, actually. Good question. Okay. I think the, our tour guides probably have it. At the Dana Center? At the Dana Center. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. rusty. It, you know, we don't know when it started, but... Um, What's great is you see where the little hook is on the chain, where it's hooked to the rock, the hook is still there. Wow. And um, it's right near the cascade at Huddlestone Arch. And you can go see it anytime. Oh. And uh, so this I love, uh, oh, I gasped when I opened this, is actually a deed. And deeds are a lot of my book. 
mostly their um, deeds uh, that I read elsewhere. But this deed is from Samuel Stilwell, who owned a great deal of the West Side, including, I believe, this, no, he didn't, he owned across the street. But um, it's a deed to um, Gillian, Gullian, Ludlow, and both of, this is the deed that became Seneca Village. I mean, generation, not generations, but years and years later. So this deed is 1802. Seneca Village starts in 1824 when John Whitehead buys the property and divides it into 200 lots. But it's amazing because I did a hole in the book uh, traced all the way back, Seneca Village all the way back to the beginning. And this is a deed that, um, because it's the Ludlow daughters uh, who gave the land for the All Angels Church and burial ground. And it's Samuel Stilwell who kept part, he sold off all of his land except the land that became Seneca Village. And he was a, a landlord to many of the Seneca Village um, uh, residents. So uh, important. And so this map is, uh, it's sort of a cadastral map which tells you the, um, owners of property, and it is the first map we have of Seneca Village and the people who own the land with their names. What's phenomenal about this map, um, amongst many different things, um, is the fact that so many either widowed or single women own property in, early on in Seneca Village. Because this map is 1836. Um, excuse me, I want to. Um, 1836, and Seneca Village, really people, even though it started in 1825, people didn't have houses then. There was one house, uh, a stable, a barn, no, a stable, a home, and a, and a, um, a well uh, on the property in 1825. So maybe someone moved in, but, uh, we'd, and we wouldn't know who. Um, but this is the map of the owners uh, as they were, you know, it was becoming a village. And uh, what I love is, um, so this map was discovered here. And it, it was discovered by, well, Seneca Village was first, you know, uh, the, ex working on the exhibit that they had here. And um, a, a wonderful man named Donald, I wish I remembered his last name, but Donald used to work for the Parks Department and I knew Donald. And so he then became an intern or an employee of the Historical Society. And um, I think he found the map and connected it to Seneca Village. And they saw that there's something called Spring Street on it. And they, nobody knew what that meant. And so Donald knew me. And so Donald called me up and said, you know, would you come over and look at this map? And so I looked at it, and they said, yeah, what does this Spring Street mean? And I said, come with me. And so we went only to 82nd Street and walked a couple of hundred feet into the park, and there is uh, um, Dr. Tanner's Spring, which uh, Dr. Tanner is a whole other story, and mainly he didn't drink from this spring, but on his 40-day fast. But anyway, that's another story. But <laughs> That's a crazy story. But um, the spring is right there in Central Park. You kind of have to look for it. It's behind a fence, but it has a little stone bench. And um, so it was so fun to watch all of the curators here go, oh my god, there's a spring. It's called Spring Street. And so um, later, in research for the book recently, there's a very scratchy, microfilmed map of Seneca Village but before it became Seneca Village, but after Samuel Stilwell. And um, there's the word spring on it in, in what was more actively Seneca Village. And so I think that the, the spring, because I always assumed, well, the spring, which was very profuse, um, the people would come over. Oh, it was owned by a man named David Wagstaff, who incidentally owned the land of this building. And um, David Wagstaff owned the land where the spring was, and I assume, you know, people just used the spring. Uh, but it turns out 
that there was um, a well in San and a spring. Uh, right on the map, it says spring in Seneca Village. So they didn't have to go around to 82nd Street. They could go to 80, I think it was 84th Street, and there was a profuse spring. But we know that one person, before it became Seneca Village, dug a well. And in doing research for the book, I read a lot of real estate ads because that's how I found out a lot of information. It, just like today, if you want to sell your property, you put an ad in the newspaper, and then you tell what your property has. And um, anyone who had a well, which was lots of people, they all were very proud of it. They're better than rainwater. You know, they would talk about how profuse their well was. And so there were wells throughout Central Park and throughout Manhattan. And James Rule Smith, he photographed in 1900 all the wells and springs. And that's in the collection. And the book is here, too, um, you know, published by the Historical Society. It's Don't good. miss it. It's <laughs> like really like a, a walk back in time, you know, all the, you could go up on the Broadway malls and, you know, pump yourself some <laughs> fresh water and, you know, it's amazing how much history uh, uh, you can learn from this book. So uh, we have a few more minutes left and a few more slides before we open up to Q&A, so why don't we uh, keep going? We have a couple so, more. Um, people, like, what did Central Park look like before it became Central Park? Well, the only photographs we have are, of course, in this building. And there are many, about 15 or 10 to 15 photographs that this is one of the more attractive ones, actually. It kind of, look, the photographs look like the surface of the moon. And you, the, no trees, rock, swamp. And so we know what, and basically 1857, so we, we really, you know, when you go look at these photographs, you can hardly believe this Central Park, but they are. And so a really important part of the collection. And uh, I think we're ending with this, yes. which is John J. Rink, and um, it has a wonderful story. It is one of the submissions for the design competition. And one day in, oh, I don't know, let's say, somewhere in the 1990s, I got a phone call uh, from a woman who said, Is there, was there a contest or something for Central Park? I'm like, yes. And she said, well, you know, I'm moving to Florida. She lived on Long Island. I'm moving to Florida, and I'm cleaning out all the stuff from my house and my mother's house. And in her attic, I found this rolled up um, thing that looks like um, it was some sort of map. It's a little colorful of Central Park. I'm like dying. You can <laughs> just imagine what I'm hearing on the other end of this phone. So I say, okay, and thanks to Roy Rosenzweig and Elizabeth Blackmar of Columbia who wrote The Park and the People, they know from the um, design competition entries the names of all the people because they were paid $10.25 if they didn't win. And so we know who was paid, so we know the names of all the competitors. And so I have the list in front of me, and I say, okay, tell me the names of all the relatives you have. And she starts naming, her last name is Jacobs, no. And she names, it goes through her mother only, because she knows it's on her mother's side, and after about three or four names, she goes, Rink, and I say, Rink, number four entry into the competition, and she says, oh, that, I, I'm gonna start to cry right now. That must be why there's a number four penciled on the back, oh my God. and I started to cry. So needless to say, wow. the next day, I left work <laughs> and drove to Westbury, Long Island, <laughs> and laid out on this shag blue carpet was this extraordinary oh, document. Yep. Extraordinary document. Yes. With, you know, pay, back, the back, uh, the, you know, it's clearly military. She named, he named it after all these military heroes of the Revolutionary War. And then some very crazy names I haven't ever been able to trace. But um, he also submitted another one that, that we don't know about, but what we have, we, you, we. have here, 
is the only other copy of bound volume of all the design competitions, and it was owned by Charles Russell, who became one of the commissioners, and the, he wrote his notes about um, all the entries to the competition. And so we have one commissioner who said, oh, entry number 33, you know, it's interesting, or whatever he said about the winners, the Olmsted and Vox <laughs> competition. But about number four, he said something that made me realize there were more than one drawing. And so, um, and when you read number four, you know that it doesn't describe this. So I would have no idea why he did two and why his written entry doesn't match it doesn't that correspond. Well, you can't imagine what Central Park might have looked like had they gone with the rink plan. We have a few other of the, the losing competition entries, too. Wearing is among them, Wearing too. And, um, and a lot of drawings by right. Roswell Graves. Right. So uh, it, is, it is quite extraordinary to even imagine what the city would be like without Olmsted and Vox's masterpiece. Yeah, we Central can't Park. imagine it. Yeah. And so... Um, I, we were doing some um, uh, meetings with the New York Historical Society and uh, Jean Ashton, the former, former library director, former, uh, library, vice, director. library director, and I happened to mention, because I didn't want to keep this, and she was moving to Florida, oh, and there were swords that came with it. Would you like the swords? I'm like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> Ken Cobb of the Municipal Archives graciously agreed to keep it in it, 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 you know, storage. And so I knew it was in a safe place, and she moved to Florida. And then I happened to mention, oh, you know, we have one of these. And the next thing I know, the Historical Society raised the money and got the um, yeah. drawing, which is why it's here. Absolutely thrilled to have it. So and thrilled to have you, and thrilled to have a little bit of extra time for Q&A. Are there any questions from the audience? Okay, and wait for the, uh, we have a mic here coming, oh. so here in the front. Thanks, that was, that was a very nice uh, uh, talk, I appreciate it. Um, by the way, the um, Met Museum had a uh, exhibit back in the 90s where they had many of the models of Central Park, yes. and I, I think the Olmsted Vox plan was the best. The, yeah. uh, they had some really out there plans, um, but my question is about, um, I was um, trying to find the actual uh, McGowan's Pass and the gatehouse, and, and during my research, I, I um, learned about a, a second tavern called the Black Horse Tavern, and there's like very little information about that tavern. It was across the road, over um, just south of where the Fort Fish area was, and I was wondering if you had any information about that tavern. Because I think that um, back when they, uh, there was a, uh, an emergency, a public health emergency, where they, they were actually, um, the city hall had moved up here. Oh. Um, do, do you know anything about that? Mm -hmm. There were two Black Horse Taverns. It's, actually, there was but one that downtown, wasn't, too. But that's different than the McGowan's Tavern, right? Different, yep. No, the first one is the McGowan's Tavern. Okay. Jacob Dykeman uh, is, the fir is the one married to... Catherine Benson McGowan's uh, was her sister, um, Catalina, who married Jacob Dykeman, and he um, started the Black Horse Tavern in 17, like 48, and sold it to Daniel McGowan in 1756. So that was the first Black Horse Tavern, and when the McGowan's um, owned the tavern, uh, they, I. I have a feeling they didn't call it the Black Horse Tavern, but then there was a tavern on 96th Street on the Kingsbridge Road, um, kind of near Fifth Avenue, a little further in, but basically where like about East Meadow would be today, and that was called the Black Horse Tavern. And so that was where General Cornwallis during the Revolutionary War, he stayed over at the Black Horse, but that wasn't the McGowan Tavern. And so there was that. But to confuse matters more, there was actually a halfway house, a tavern, Dutch tavern, basically around Malcolm X Boulevard inside the park around 109th Street. And that was the first tavern 
built in the area, and it was known as the halfway house because it was halfway between one of Manhattan and the other. And then the McGowan Tavern, which was many years later, got referred to as the halfway house. So it's hard to research things because, you know, you just don't know which tavern they're talking about. But there was a building across from the McGowan's on the path to Fort Fish, but we don't know what that was. But I don't think it was a tavern. And he wasn't planted. She actually knew this, like, off the top of her head. This is actually quite extraordinary. You didn't, you didn't anticipate I that question. Know. When you work for a place for 39 years, you kind Oh, but of, still, that's, that's know, very remember impressive. Stuff. <laughs> Any other uh, questions uh, over here? Just wait for the uh, mic, please. <laughs> Thanks so much. Do we know who Eliza's father was? No, we don't. Well, that was... Oh, good question. And you are you do go down every rabbit hole too. Oh, I and know. what I didn't what I didn't um, say is we also you I I love this place. That's so much. okay. It's you could call call it we. <laughs> and we're, we're proud to have you as part of our our gang of researchers. So. They also have Jane's manumission papers. Andrew um, freed her in 1814. No mention. They may not have been enslaved. We don't know. Um, you know, there was a whole gradual manumissions act, and certain children children weren't were supposed to serve until females till 25, and um, males until 28. But you know, there was a lot of gray areas at this time. There's a wonderful book called Somewhat Independent by Shane White, who's a wonderful historian, that talks about this period, and I really highly recommend it. Uh, it's, it's a brilliant book, brilliantly researched. Um, if you want to know more about um, uh, uh, slavery in these, like, turn of cent 19th century, uh, I mean, seven, 17th to 18th century, uh, very, very interesting. 18th to 19th century. And it's here in the library. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other questions over here? Just wait for the mic, please. Thank you. The, uh, the book is phenomenal. I have two copies of it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> one on the Kindle and, and one hardbound. Um, you had mentioned the springs, the natural springs that people in Seneca Village could use for fresh water. Um, but when the reservoir was completed in the 1840s, did people have access to that? No. No, they had actually a water view. Uh, if you look at the, I think it's the Library of Congress, I'm not remembering my source, but the York Hill Reservoir is built on a hill. So the northern part is at the top of the hill, and the southern part had a big wall. But the people who lived in Seneca Village were more or less on the same level as the water. So they would have had a water view. And the two reservoir keepers actually lived in Seneca Village. I don't count them as residents because they weren't there by choice. They were there because of their job. But, um, and they, were, got to leave, they got to stay when everybody else had to leave. So I don't consider the 21 members of their two families as, mm -hmm. as Seneca Village residents. But anyway, um, they uh, did have a water view, and you don't know what kind of arrangement. Um, the Sisters of Charity of Mount St. Vincent, who wound up um, having a mother house on the site of the McGowan house many years later, they finagled somehow to get water, a pipe, to go from the reservoir to the mother house um, through some you know, means that I can't remember. I did once know. I apologize. Don't remember everything. But um, okay. OK, you caught me. Uh, but um, but they, they got water and uh, eventually, but not, not the people. No one in, in, in the park who lived in the park. And in fact, Many people, they, they were running, um, in the 1850s, they were running a pipe down 8th Avenue, and um, it somehow burst and, and damaged many people who lived in the park, and they were compensated by the Croton um, Aqueduct Board. Mm. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. There are none other? Well, I do have one question for you, and that is, 
you began as a photographer and quickly became a historian, but still you document uh, in, in, in very visual ways, obviously. How did you make that transition? Not an easy one, I wouldn't think. You mean from photographer to yeah. historian? Yes. Actually, they inform each other. Yeah. Uh, well, the, the real story, people have never asked me, but okay. Um, the real I, also, story, the other question is Cedar. The real story. Is Cedar, did you become you know, a Central Park person with the middle name Cedar? I mean, which I know, came it first? Was <laughs> I was destined. Named after a tree, I was destined. Um, so I was hired as the photographer. Uh, for this fledgling organization, the Central Park Conservancy. And um, you had to own your own cameras, own your own dark room. I mean, they had no money. So you had to own everything. And uh, I didn't. I mean, I did. Uh, and um, so, uh, you know, I, I, they bought the film. Of course, there was no digital then. And so uh, I had to go develop the film. And you know, they had no money, but, and they had no money to pay me. But it was, you know, it, it was lovely. I, can't, I just loved the mission right away. And that was enough. And I was lucky enough to, you know, have a husband who earned the money. <laughs> so I could take this very low paying job. Anyway, eventually they bought me a camera. And that was really nice. And then eventually they let me have a lab to develop the film. I still had a dark room to print pictures, but anyway. So five or so years into it, I'm like, okay, it's time for a raise. So I have a meeting with Betsy Rogers, who I love dearly. And um, I go in and say, uh, I, can I have a raise? <laughs> <laughs> like even a little one, and I've and she's like, you've worked here five years. You're wonderful. Yes, yes, um, but we have to make you something. I can't just go to the board and say, okay, I'm going to give this person a raise. That isn't the way it works. So we have to make you something. So I said, okay, I have a master's degree in art history, and I had a master's MFA in photography, but. Um, I have a research degree, and I was doing research for, it wasn't part of my job, but everything was part of my job, so I did research as well, historic research, that's how I learned about this place in the first place, and so she went, okay, you can be the historian, not ever dreaming that I would take it seriously. And the minute I had that card, that business card that said historian slash photographer, I started reading everything how and wonderful. living here. We are so very, very fortunate that that happened and that you are here. Uh, we, by the way, do have the Central Park Conservancy papers as well as Betsy Barlow Rogers' papers here I too. That. So that and, would be um, uh, it's most appropriate to have you uh, in this room uh, and with this wonderful audience. Thank you so much, Sarah Cedar Miller, and thank you, audience. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming.